Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. Come on, stand up. Let's worship together this morning. to love you You are good and you are kind You bring joy into my life You make it easy to trust you You have never left my side You've been faithful every time
weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. And yes, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh,
Good to see you this morning. Welcome. Thank you for being here with us. If you're our guest this morning, we offer a special welcome to you. Thank you for joining us. And if you would, uh, please look in the pew rack in front of you, and you should find a communication card there. We would love to have you fill that out so we would have a record of your attendance and know how to get in touch with you. And that's also for all the regular attendants, the home folks here. If any of your information has changed, you can fill that out and uh, let us know so that we have your proper uh, contact points so we can get in touch with you when we need to. And also, as always, on the back of that card, there is the void where you can put your prayer requests. We love to pray along with you and, and whatever it is that you may be going through, your family may be going through, whatever may be uh, struggling through, whatever you may be concerned with, we would love to pray with you about those things. So if you'd give your pastors the opportunity to do that, just write that down on the back of the card and you can drop them in the plate back there at the door or in the slot in the hall and we would love to be able to do that. And speaking of the plates in the slot, offering, uh, that's where we're dropping them. So if you uh, have your tithes and offerings this morning, we welcome you to drop them there in, in the plate or in, in the hallway because ministry still continues. Even though we're not passing plate, uh, the work of the kingdom still goes on. In fact, uh, I was down this past week, not this week, but the week before, uh, down in Honduras, down there uh, doing some work with those guys. It was a wonderful trip. I, I told y'all, and most of you know that we were down there, and uh, we went down there to work with pastors. We've had a pastor training institute uh, down in Honduras for about four years that got closed down due to COVID back in uh, last March, or like, uh, March of 20. And uh, so for the last year and a half, there's been no pastor training going on, which is, which is bad because it is such a great need. There is such a huge need for these pastors to be trained uh, in, in good theology. And uh, so uh, that's been missing for these last 18 to 20 months and so we were able to go down there the, uh, a week ago and have a conference, a three-day pastor conference, where we had 26 pastors there where we were training with them for them three days. And it was a wonderful, wonderful time, very, uh, very productive pastors asking really good, deep questions, questions that we had to stop back and sit back and, and think about answers to. So they're not just, you know, digging in surface. They're, they're really digging in. They really have a desire to rightly divide the word of truth what, what a what a blessing it was to see these guys so hungry for for knowledge in the scripture so that they can train their people in the knowledge of the and the truth of the scripture and then we got to deal with some logistical stuff which was part of our trip what we went to do meet, meet some people and handle some some business stuff so that we can get the pastor training institute back up and running and praise god it looks like everything is on board for march of 2022 for the pastor training institute after a two-year hiatus to kick back off and be running full force being run by honduran pastors who are taking taking the reins where we just kind of step back and give oversight and letting the the native people train their own people so i'm, I'm very excited about that and what god is doing down there in honduras among those people among those pastors and in those villages where people are coming to christ it was just a a wonderful wonderful trip and i'm, I'm thankful to be able to be a I've been a part of it, and I look forward to continued partnerships of going down there and continue to train pastors. So uh, thank you for your support. Thank you for your prayers. And I go back to the tithe. Your, your, your tithes and your offerings are things that make this possible. We support this pastor's training institute so that we can get good theology in the hands of these men who are teaching in these places. And it's not just Honduras. We have missionaries in Romania and in India and in the Middle East and Brazil. These are people that, that we know and that are hands-on in their particular field, in their particular area of the world, who are carrying the message of the gospel. So thank you, church, for your support, for your help, for your part in, in the ministries of this church that go far outside the walls of this church, far outside of this community, far outside of our, our nation. So it's a, it's a blessing to be a part of that, and you, you are a part of that. So thank you. But with that, this morning... And I'll, I'll talk more about this in a little bit, but uh, this morning, uh, our services today are a little bit different. They're not going to be services as normal because this is an international day of prayer for the persecuted church. And so this morning, that's going to be our focus. And that's really the, 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 the song set is talking about the goodness of God, his faithfulness, even in the middle of pain, even in the middle of suffering, even when we don't understand, even when hard times come, God is still faithful. God is still trustworthy. He is still He's still God. He's still in control. He's still on the throne. Even when we don't understand, even when we have questions, God's got it all under control, and we can trust in him. We can rely on him. So as we worship this morning, I want you to keep that, that thought in mind, and I want you to open your heart and really worship him today and thank thankfulness for his goodness, for his faithfulness. 
right? Let's, let's pray. Father, we, uh, we love you so much. And uh, God, we are thankful for your goodness, for your faithfulness, God, that even when we're faithless, you are faithful. Even when we are unlovable, you are loving. Because it's not about us at all. It's about you. And it's about the fact that you cannot fail. It's about the fact that no matter what the enemy may do in this world, he is a defeated foe. You have overcome death. You have arisen and you reign victorious and glorious throughout the eternal ages. And so it's to our risen King that we sing our praises today. It's to our mighty God who, roam, who, who rules and reigns over this universe that we, we pray, sing out our praises today. So God, as we sing to you, as we worship you in these moments, God, I pray that you would hear our hearts, that these wouldn't just be words coming out of our mouth, but Lord, we would really meditate on the words that we are singing. And they would really be the echo of our heart, the words of our heart, knowing that in our faith in Christ, we cannot be shaken. So God, come and move among us today as we go through this time and we remember our brothers and sisters in Christ who suffer greatly for their faith. God, help us to lift them up in prayer today. Just move among us and have your way in us. And we'll thank you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. For we trust in our God And through His unfailing love We will not be shaken we will not be shaken we will not be shaken for we trust in our god and through his unfailing love we will not be shaken we will not be shaken we will not be shaken against us on all sides we will not be shaken we will not be shaken we will not be shaken for in the hour of our darkest day we will not tremble we won't be Rising like the light of dawn Our God is for us, He has overcome For we trust in our God And through His unfailing love We will not be shaken, we will not be shaken against him will fall for our God is stronger 
He can do all things No higher name we can call For Jesus is greater He can do all things You know it's true, church All those against Him will fall For our God is strong Surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. And I'm no longer a slave to fear, I am a child of God. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. From my mother's womb, you have chosen me. Love has called my name And I've been born again Into your family Your blood flows through my veins And I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child
child of God I'm no longer a slave to fear I am a child of God
forces invaded Richard and Sabina Wormbrand's home country, Romania. There were no safe spaces for Jews. And though Christian, Richard and Sabina were ethnic Jews. Afraid, for I am with you. Genesis 26. Do not be afraid of them. Joshua 8. I am. I'm kind of afraid. They are asking to see IDs. All our lives remain in. Now we're Jews only. Christian, really? Show me where the fish party is going, right? Parte, știu că ascunze vrei aici. Puteți să vă uitați, dar nu e niciun evreu aici. Perhaps you should get out if you still can. Run away? If we stay, I'll follow the others into prison. It will be the end of our life together. Whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. We believe this or we don't. 
Richard and Sabina, like many Christians during World War II, had a choice. Lay low and hope the worst passed them by. Or get involved and be the hands and feet of Christ. All at great personal risk. I think we have to stay. We have a job to do. If they are coming, then they are coming. Let's not think of them as enemies to be feared, but rather as a mission. Like Sabina and Richard Wormbrand, today's persecuted Christians, living in hostile areas and restricted nations are bold witnesses for Christ. Choosing to give up their comfort and safety in this world in order to find a life that counts for eternity. The first request from our persecuted Christian brothers and sisters is, will you pray for me? As we pray for them to endure opposition in order to advance the gospel, may we be inspired by their example to pay any price necessary in obedience to Christ. This morning, it is the International Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And our hope, our intention this morning is to open our eyes to the reality of the suffering of our brothers and sisters around the world. Uh, precious people of God who put their very lives on the line just for calling Christ Savior. And this morning, we're going to hear from a number of people. Uh, We've got three videos from people from, from different nations uh, who are going to, uh, people that we are partners with in, in ministry that we were talking about uh, just a few minutes ago. We've got some videos from them who are going to be sharing with us about things that they see, they experience in their land. They're going to be leading us through some times of prayer. We have some people uh, who are going to come up from our congregation and lead us in intentional prayer points. So this morning, that's what it's about. It's going to be a little different, but Ian is going to get up here in just a minute and preach a sermon yet. Good luck. But he's going to uh, lead us into a, a, a time with, with, a, with, a, with a brief, a shorter message. I don't know. I'm never going to call you Ian Brief. Uh, and then we're going to go into an intentional time of prayer uh, this morning. And, I, and as we do that, I, I want to ask you, I want to encourage you, lean in. Uh, don't let this just be something distant from you. Because where we live in the safety and security of our great land, it's easy to remove ourselves from the reality of what our brothers and sisters face. And we come into this room with, with no fear of being drug out in the street. We sit on padded pews in an air conditioning or heated building out of the rain while there are more Christians around the world who do not have this privilege than there are. People who sneak around in darkness move through the shadows of the night uh, hiding themselves to meet in small dark rooms where they can't sing out loud and proud like we did this morning to the praises of our king they have to sing out in a hushed whisper because if someone outside hears them they're going to be drug out in the street so lean in hear the reality of what our brothers and sisters face and, and let that drive you to a place of prayer because that's the biggest thing we can do for them that's their number one request that they ask from, our, from their brothers and sisters here is please pray for us so this morning that's what we want to do we want to, we want to be faithful to honor their request and we want to spend some time in prayer this morning so Ian come on up and, get, and lead us into this time Before we start, uh, I had an opportunity to chat with uh, 
reply to Ethan on Messenger this morning, and he gave me permission to share that he has been diagnosed with a very aggressive form of leukemia. So I would encourage you uh, to not just pray for Clyde's healing, but pray that he would be given opportunities to speak the truth of who Jesus is, to be courageous, for he knows where he is going. So please lift up Clyde uh, as you think each day. Uh, He has undergone his first, thank you. He's undergone his first chemotherapy, but because of other health concerns, the doctors uh, have to be delicate in how they treat him. So please pray for Clyde and Teresa as well. Today we honor and recognize and observe the International Day of Prayer for the persecuted church we call IDOP. 340 million Christians around the world ex- uh, experience extreme persecution and discrimination for following Christ. One in eight followers around the world. Why does God allow persecution? Why is it that the church is growing fastest in countries where persecution is most severe? The book of Acts opens with the very last moments of Christ's physical presence on earth. Jesus gave his apostles one last instruction to witness to the city of Jerusalem, the area of Judea and Samaria, and even to the ends of the earth, and then Jesus was lifted up while they were looking on, and a cloud received him out of their sight. So the apostles did just that. The early church was growing by huge numbers. Peter preached his first message at Pentecost where 3,000 souls recognized Jesus as Messiah. Those 3,000 people didn't know any better, so they began continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Acts 2, verse 42. Over the next couple of chapters of Acts, we see something extraordinary take place. Opposition began to grow against this loving bunch of guys that walked and lived by faith in a passionate authentic way. Peter had just healed the lame man and together with the apostles went to Herod's temple and found themselves inundated by the people at Solomon's portico. Peter preached his second message. 5,000 were saved. The priests, the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees were greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. As a result, these religious leaders that we have been looking at in John, these religious leaders toss Peter and all his colleagues into jail. They hold a trial and question Peter as to what authority he had to speak of such things. So Peter for all his errors and for all his quirks and all his failings while he was with Jesus, Peter lays it on him by answering the question of the ages that concludes there is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. The apostles were released with the warning that they had better not preach or teach in the name of Jesus. A short while later, maybe a day or two later, we find Peter and the apostles back at the portico of Solomon teaching in the name of Jesus the very thing they were warned not to do. Back to jail they go for the night, but this night would be different. An angel of the Lord appears and opens the gates of prison and tells them, go back to the temple and teach the whole message. They arrived back at the temple about daybreak and began to teach 
And that brings us to our passage today in Acts chapter 5, verse 27. Will you turn, please, to Acts chapter 5? While you're turning there, please uh, just go with me in prayer for our brother Clyde. Father, we ask you, Lord, that you would touch Clyde, touch Teresa. Lord, give wisdom and guidance to the medical team that will be guiding his treatment. But Lord, we know ultimately you are the great physician. All healing comes from you, whether it be on this earth or in heaven beyond. Lord, I pray that you would give Clyde strength, courage, boldness to share the truth of his Savior with boldness and confidence, knowing whom he has believed in and had put his full trust and confidence in the finished work of Christ. Now, Lord, as we open up your holy and perfect book, Lord, give us ears to hear the incredible wisdom that comes from his pages. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. The Bible says, When they had brought them, they stood them before the council. The high priest questioned them. We gave you strict orders not to continue teaching in this name, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. But Peter and the apostles answered, We must obey God rather than man, one of the most misused passages of scripture in the Bible. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had put to death by hanging him on a cross. He is the one whom God exalted to his right hand as a prince and a savior to grant repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. But when they had heard this, they were cut to the quick and intended to kill them. But a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law, respected by all the people, stood up in the council and gave orders to put the men outside for a short time. And he said to them, Men of Israel, take care of what you propose to do with these men. For some time ago, Thutis rose up claiming to be somebody, And a group of about 400 men joined up with him. But he was killed, and all who followed him were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away some people after him. He too perished, and all those who followed him were scattered. So in the present case, I say to you, stay away from these men and let them alone, for if this plan or action is of men it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you'll not be able to overthrow them or else you may even be found fighting against God. They took his advice. And after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on preaching Jesus as the Christ. Biblical persecution results from our position in Christ. For those of us that follow Jesus, can we expect persecution? 2 Timothy 3.12 says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly will be persecuted. While we may not suffer the same type or the same extent of persecution as the world watch lists 50 worst countries in the world, I believe we're seeing things take shape that will usher in widespread persecution in the coming years. The persecution we see now has taken on a different form. As you saw in the video, Satan is our enemy. He is our adversary, and he knows and understands how things work. Our enemy can use most anything as a diversion to get our focus away from God. Satan's not so concerned with lost folk. He's not even particularly concerned with people 
who don't really passionately follow Christ. He seeks to destroy you, to deceive you, to discourage you. And there is a reason. When people look at you, and I think of our brother Clyde laying in his hospital bed, seeking and anticipating being released, when they see us suffer, people all around us watch us, and what we do and how we respond and how we react is representative of who Christ is within us. We are not Christ, but we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. We have his DNA. While I believe tortuous persecution will come to these United States, religious persecution, for the most part, is not tolerated. Unless, of course, you are a Christian. The church has taken on a defensive position and has fallen back. Under the cultural schemes of intolerance and judgment, the church, by and large, has grown silent in America. We're told by society how we're supposed to act. In fact, people probably tell you things like, you did that and you call yourself a Christian, because even the lost world knows how Christians are supposed to behave. We've become unwitting pawns in Satan's plan and have become introverted in our faith. Oh, Pastor Ian, speaking about Christ is just not my comfort zone. I'm an introvert. I'm shy. These are the same people who will talk about their dogs to strangers in the line at Walmart. These are people who will show hundreds of pictures of their grandchildren to strangers in any checkout line they come to. But when it comes to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, they're all of a sudden a shy introvert that can't somehow manage to form sentences. It's all part of Satan's scheme. Oh, I might say the wrong thing, Pastor Ian. I don't have the boldness that you have. Jesus Christ is the same in me as he is in you. I fail every day. Why don't we trust in God and say the words that he gives us? I believe that he will give you the words that you need to share with that person exactly when you need to share them. But too often we make excuses and say, no, I don't have time. I got to get to the next thing. And so we've got professing believers driving around our community remaining silent for Christ. Well, I've got the bumper sticker. I've got the tattoos. They'll be my witness. We don't see that example in Scripture, but we do see the example of people sharing their faith in Christ at great cost. We misprioritize life and sometimes misprioritize it even for a moment with things that are not necessarily bad in themselves but when we place those things above the Lord they become idols how does he do this how does Satan attack us after all he is the one on the offensive he attacks our marriages one of the principal foundations of society He attacks relationships, pitting friends against friends. He leads us to think about ourselves rather than others. We're deceived about the truth because we form opinions of the Bible without ever looking at the Bible. We have the freedom to worship the one and only true God, and yet we fall into the trap of the enemy we are convinced that we can have casual, shallow associations with believers. I don't need to go to church. I can be a Christian and stay at home. I don't need to go to Sunday school or community group. I can do all that on my own. We're convinced that we can just do things on our own. The early believers were together continuously And we find it nearly impossible to spend an hour or two with fellow believers. 
just don't have time. I've got to look at my calendar because I, I've got, you know, I've got these kids and they got to get to, they got to get to all these different activities. Those activities are not bad in themselves, but when you put those activities above your fellowship with Christ, they become idols. 300 college students a year are drafted into the NFL. Chances are slim your kid is going to be one of those 3 I'm sorry, 300 kids from the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of collegiate athletes. The chances of making it to the Olympics are nearly zero. But do you know what the chances of making it to heaven are? If you sow into your children, way yonder better than their chance to play in any major league sport. I wonder why we do that. Why do we put everything into things that do not last for eternity? These early believers were together all the time. Our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world see the tools Satan uses against them. Those that oppress and persecute are visible. Their enemy can be seen. And we have Christians fighting amongst themselves and attacking one another when Satan is the enemy. The world desperately needs to see the power of God that was evident in Peter's life in us. And you say, well, Pastor Ian, if it was only like that, if this was just like first century Jerusalem, we could do that. Yo, we got it way yonder better than first century Jerusalem. The world needs to see that we're confident in Christ, that we're bold in Christ, and most of all, that we are loving in Christ, but you must use biblical definitions of love. If you love me, you wouldn't judge me. I judge you because I love you, but I judge in accordance with Scripture. Don't believe the nonsense that people tell you. After the disciples were flogged in Acts 5, uh, 5 verse 40 for teaching in Jesus' name, we come to verse 41 and 42. So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing. They rejoiced that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. They had just been flogged. If you don't know what flogging is, it's one of the most cruel punishments that you can receive. And when they left, they rejoiced. Hallelujah. I was able to suffer for Jesus. And so what did they do? <laughs> Every day in the temple, and also from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. Today, your child is told he can't bring his Bible to school, and parents cower back in fear over what the school board will do. Don't be afraid. Well, the teacher said, I can't pray. I can't pray in school. Nonsense. This is still America. You are the parent of your child. We have teachers in here that will tell you the truth. Go to those teachers. Don't believe the garbage that you're told in America that what you can and cannot do. We still have the Constitution until they tear it up. I will serve Jesus and I will proclaim his name. Whatever will happen, I will be there. Not in my own power. But Jesus is there. Jesus is there. They were not deterred. Hallelujah. We are counted worthy to suffer in your name, Jesus. The time we're supposed to draw close to Christ, we actually withdraw and blame God for our circumstances. We blame him for abandoning us in our time of need. We had a conversation the other night. My wife and I hosted a young couple over at our house, and we talked about hitting rock bottom. And we talked about Joseph and how some might consider Joseph had hit rock bottom. And if you don't know the story of Joseph in the Old Testament, it seemed like every time he turned around, bad things were happening to him. 
And we don't have anything recorded about him lamenting or being discouraged or, or wondering where had God gone. But if we look at his circumstances, I mean, he was sold in, he was thrown into a pit by his brothers. When they, thought, they saw they could make some cash, they got him out of the pit and sold him into slavery. But every opportunity, Joseph, because God was directing him, Joseph kept going. He kept following Christ regardless of the circumstances. And he's one of the greatest heroes of our faith. We don't see him lamenting over circumstances, and you don't have to either. Rejoice, Paul said. Again, I say rejoice, not because things are happening, but because Jesus will never leave you, will never sake you, and will give you strength in the time of greatest need. We, shift, we need to shift our focus to God and off of ourselves. Will you allow circumstances to control your faith? Or will you allow the power of God to shine in your life regardless of what's going on? We often ask the question, if faced with adversity, would you deny Christ? I'll ask you a different question. If faced with life, would you deny Christ? Isn't that, in essence, what we do when we abandon the fundamental principles of the faith? You have all been sentenced to life on this earth, however long that may come, however many days, months, years, however long it is. If faced with life on this planet, will you deny Christ? I'm going to ask Eric Rupel to come up as he's going to lead us, beginning with several prayers offered on behalf of uh, our congregation to the persecuted church. So Eric, come to that microphone. I kind of thought about it two different ways, actually. Those wanting out and those called by God to stay, whether expats or native Christians. So we want to lift up both today. I just wanted to read Psalm 138, 7 and 8. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. You stretch out your hand against the anger of my foes. With your right hand, you save me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your faithful love, Lord, endures forever. Do not abandon the works of your hands. Let us pray. Lord, we don't know how many of your Christians are still in Afghanistan under Taliban rule now. But you do. We know that you care about each and every one. Let them feel that as part of the worldwide church, we stand with them. We pray for your wisdom, guidance, and safety, as well as deliverance for those seeking to get out. But many may be being led by your Holy Spirit to stay and continue to be a light in those dark surroundings. For all those still there, we ask in Jesus' name for your hedge of protection all around them, along with discernment, as they don't know who their friends or enemies really are. We pray that the unbelieving Muslims and Taliban will come to know you in a real and personal way through those you have empowered to stay or by your Holy Spirit in whatever way you choose to work, Father God. Lord, whatever their needs might be, we ask that you would provide them, show them your love, mercy, grace, and your peace that passes all understanding. merciful and gracious loving God and we leave them in your hands it's in your son's Jesus name that we pray and all God's people said amen hi my name is Matej Branistaranu and I live in Romania I am working as a missionary and church planter since 2002 when I left my secular job in order to serve my Lord and Savior full time. I spent 23 years under communism regime. I was born into a Christian family and I understood since then that I have to be a light in the world. So I really meant that. Apostle Paul said in uh, two. 2 Timothy chapter 3 verse 12 that indeed 
all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. All who desire. I realized the truth of that word my entire life. Living under communist regime, I have experienced persecution since I went to school, first grades. From time to time, the headmaster in school and the communist representative used to call me in front of a committee to give an account for the hope that was in me. And I remember I was weeping being so young and fragile, but in spite of my fear, I was bold and used the sword of God against them. One of them asked me once if I ever saw God, for he said that God does not exist. And I reply that, can you look right into the sun during the summer? No, of course you can. So how can you expect to see God who is much greater than the sun? Than the sun? I often used to quote Matthew 5, 8. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I did not understand that back then, but I have realized after that they could not stand against God's wisdom, no matter if that person is a child or an adult, an educated or not educated person, because it was God that was involved there. Amazingly, I have discovered since then that I was speaking to people words that I never studied, as Jesus promised into his word, for it is not you who speak, but is the Holy Spirit. But what was interesting was that the long they persecuted me, the long that testimony of mine, attract, make some colleague to love me and of course some other to hate me. But I have the opportunity to invite those that love me to our tiny church in the village and they were having the possibility to hear the word of God. And I became a little missionary since that age. Again, I dealt with much persecution into the army, where I was locked up several times without food or water, and beaten up. They were accusing me I make proselytism into the military camp, and the general was then in, that was in charge then threatened my life several times. But God sent me an angel in the person of one of his officers, and that uh, guy said to me then, Mate, do not be afraid, for you will go home, and nothing will happen to you. And when you will go to America, please tell people what kind of life we are experiencing here in Romania. I had to carry another burden in the military base, the burden that I had two brothers that escaped borders and fled to the United States, and that was something they hate mostly have people escape the borders and tell outside the borders what was happening that time in Romania. Now, before I pray, let me read to you a passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our afflictions so that we will be able to comfort those who are in any afflictions with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For just as the sufferings of Christ are ours in abundance, so also our comfort is abundant through Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Dear Lord, I am praying to you as our Father there are in heavens and has all the power and authority in heavens and on earth. We, the family, your family, come before you to humble ourselves and to give thanks for you, have saved us and made us your children through the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ. We are so grateful that you sent us your Spirit that is within us, and he is called our Advocate, our Paracletos, our Comforter, Lord, we are so thankful for your word, the scriptures, that comfort us into our tribulations. Lord, please have mercy on our brothers and sisters that face persecution in Egypt, Iraq, Syria, to have
have the courage and wisdom to be bold for Jesus in the face of ongoing discrimination. Please, Father, prepare Christians for the reality of violent attacks by extremists. You have promised us into your word that I will not leave you nor forsake you. So please be with them. Send people to comfort them, to encourage them in the word, to let them know that they are not alone, but tens of thousands and thousands of thousands are with them, with them praying for them, Lord. Let them understand that if they are with you, they are the majority. Please let them know that they are not alone. Do not let Satan to, Satan to tempt them, but deliver them from evil. Father, we beg you to anoint them with your balm from heaven. Put some balm on their wounds, anoint them physically and spiritually to be able to go through all you allow them to go through their lives. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Please join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come today to pray for the persecuted church. We come to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. We would like to lift up our brothers and sisters in North Korea, Somalia, Eritrea, and Iran. Lord, they're going through unimaginable things, risking their lives to spread the word of your love and grace to those who don't know your word. And Lord, we can't even begin to understand how scared and alone they must feel. Please wrap your merciful hands around each and every one of them and bring them the peace and comfort of the Holy Spirit as we come to pray for them. I am reminded of 1 John 5.14. This is the confidence we have in him. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. I pray that our brothers and sisters touch the right hearts and your words can turn the persecuted church into the rejoicing church. And our brothers and sisters being held in captivity can be released and openly share your word and worship freely. Please give us the courage to go out here and openly share your word with everyone around us. A place where we don't have to worry about speaking to the wrong person, where we can proclaim your love on the streets and not worry about risking our family's lives to share your gospel, which is something that most of us do take for granted. It's in your name I pray. Amen. We serve a God who will supply all of our needs. Many of those needs we have we don't appreciate what it is to need or to want here in the greatest country in the world. It's such a blessing to live here. A lot of times we don't realize that so many people around the world lack such basic things. But the one thing sometimes that we're guilty of in America of lacking is faith and lacking a desire, a true desire and need for God. We think about some of our fellow Christians and fellow brothers and sisters in Christ around the world that have what seems like the simplest of things that we struggle to find here in America in so many ways. Let's pray for them. God, we come to you just thanking you that your provision is greater than anything this world can provide. That the needs that you can meet are far beyond what man can dream of or understand. We pray for our brothers and sisters in countries like Nigeria, Egypt, Syria, Burkina Faso, that are literally having everything stripped away, God, because of extremists in those countries. But Lord, we know that nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Nothing can separate us from that, that, that provision that you have, God. And we pray, Lord, that you would meet them where they are, Lord, and fill them with boldness, comfort them, as Matei said. Lord, that you would uh, provide for those needs physically, God, and Lord, even though they may not have what 
the world would consider to be means, God, we know that they have infinite riches in you, Lord, and that you would lavish those on them. Lord, and that we would take a lesson away from that, that God will supply for our needs if we pursue him in boldness. Lord, that they are truly blessed because of the persecution they receive, Lord, and that you would let them know that they are not alone, that they are being lifted up by millions around the world, God, not only in spirit, but Lord, also by physical means, Lord. Not only do we go and meet their needs directly, God, but we also meet them indirectly by meeting with the Father. And we praise you. We praise you for providing for them. We praise you for lifting them up. We praise you for the boldness that they have, God. And we we would pray that we would have that same boldness as well to share and to be a light in the world. In Jesus' name. Hello, Three Rivers. This is David Lawson with Hope and Help International. I wanted to start by saying thank you. Thank you for supporting and us and praying for us. Thank you because of you, we're able to continue to work in South Asia. I wanted to talk to you about the persecuted church just for a few minutes. I've uh, had the incredible privilege to work with some guys in Asia that are seriously persecuted. Uh, one young man that I was talking to, I asked him about his background. Tell me about your life. Tell me about your background. He saw his pastor being burned to death, and as a result, he surrendered to ministry. Where do you meet guys like that? They were so incredibly persecuted, they saw their pastor burned to death. And they said, you know what? God has called me into ministry. Let me tell you two quick stories, start to finish. Trained a group of guys in one place in Asia. Encouraged them to get out and find tribes that have never been engaged with the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I came back the next year and I said, so tell me about your year. And one of them said, oh, we found a village that had never heard the gospel. And it was in a tribe that had never been engaged. There were no uh, churches in that village or in that tribe anywhere. And I said, that's fantastic. What did you do? He said, I went into the village, and they asked me who I was, and I told them, and I began to share the gospel with them. And in just a few minutes, six men gave their life to Jesus Christ. Six? Right away, right now, they heard about a God that forgave sin, and they embraced it. They wanted it. So he went into a little hut with them, and he was praying for them and talking to them. And another group of men came into the hut, and they grabbed him, and they drug him out, and they began to beat him viciously. Before long, they drug him through the jungle to another village that had a police officer. That police officer then arrested him and threw him in jail for being beaten. Because obviously, if you're being beaten, you've done something wrong. He didn't tell me how long he'd been in jail, but when he got out, I said, what did you do? And he said this. Are you ready? He said, I went right back to the village where they beat me. I said, why? He said, because I have disciples there. So he goes back to the village, rounds up those six that had given their life to Christ, takes them back into the same little hut, begins to pray for them again. Men from the village heard that he was there. They come running in, and again, they grabbed him, they drug him out of the hut, and as they were beginning to beat him, he managed to jump up and begin to share the gospel. They stopped and listened, and every man that had beat him gave their life to Jesus Christ. There are now 13 churches among that tribe. A persecuted church? Yes. It's rough, it's bloody, and it's ugly. But listen to me. Listen. Are you ready? The church thrives on persecution. Everywhere that we teach in South Asia, where the persecution is violent, the church is growing. Because as the church fathers said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Hey, take a few minutes this week. Pray this week and today for the persecuted church. One more story, and then we'll pray together young man that said he saw his pastor burned to death. Persecutors came against him in his village. He took his sister, his wife, and his family, and they fled into the jungle. Now listen to his attitude. He said, we ran for our lives, but my sister was in labor. So we hid under the leaves of a large bush. And I thought, oh, man, that, that's awful. And he 
said, no, no, it was great. She went into labor. But because she could bite down on a stick, she didn't scream. Now, she's in labor in the jungle, and the persecutors ran into the jungle looking for them. And he said, but it's okay because God sent a thunderstorm, and it rained, and they couldn't see us. So we climbed over the top of that mountain and down the other side, but the police called us and tried to force us to convert away from Christianity. He said, eventually we escaped and we found our way to a refugee camp, but somebody put arsenic in the drinking water and people were dying, so we escaped again. Eventually, he wound up in a large slum in the city where I was teaching. He, lived, he said, I live in a small house in the slum and I have a church. And because I'm a Westerner and I don't understand that kind of persecution, I said, but aren't you angry because of what these men did for you? And listen to what he said almost embarrassed to have to answer the question for an American. He said, I'm not angry and I'm not bitter because we don't know the plans of God. Perhaps he wants me in this slum to win souls for him. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the courage and the faithfulness of your people on the front lines. Jesus promised that we'd be persecuted and he promised that he would grow his church. Father, those two things don't always work together the way we want them to, but I pray particularly for these two pastors who are planting churches in rough, difficult places, that they would see your hand at work, that you would encourage them, that you would strengthen them. Father, I pray for Three Rivers, that they would know you and the, the fellowship of your sufferings in ways that would only drive them deeper into your word and deeper in a relationship with you. And thank you for their love for Hope and Help International and for the way they have taken care of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Love you guys. Amen. These are stories from people that we know, that we have relationships with. And if you listen to Mate, do you remember when his persecution started? First grade. In the first grade. You're like six years old in the first grade, right? And this little guy is being called into the headmaster's office and asked to give an account for who he believes in. This is in communist Romania. This was before the revolution in 1989. First grade. And the little guy answers, have you seen God? Can you look into the sun and see him? No, it's too bright, and my God is way more powerful than that. In the first grade, and we have people that are grown-ups. Oh, I'm, 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 I'm just too shy. I don't, I don't want anybody to ask me. And if you heard David, who represents Hope and Help International, they do mission work, teaching, much like in Honduras, past, uh, pastor training. Carrie has been with them a number of times. Hey, tell me about your background. We yeah, asked surrendered, surrendered to ministry because my pastor got burned alive. Oh, okay. These are not people who we read stories about in a book. I've known David for over 20 years. I've known Matthew for like uh, about the same time. These are people we have relationships. Persecution is real. And we have a responsibility being in America, as Jonathan said, the greatest nation in all the land because we have the freedom to help. We're privileged to be able to help by praying. Do you think they're having a dedicated service in Afghanistan or Iraq or Eritrea or Somalia or any of those other countries that uh, Jonathan and Zach and Eric mentioned? No, we have a privilege. And so as you've heard people pray and you've heard about the persecuted church, I wonder if you would commit yourself to pray. And you're like, Pastor Ian, I wouldn't know how to pray. I wouldn't know what to pray. Well, probably all of you, if you are of the talking age, probably have what this thing is called as a smartphone. The one that automatically set the time to the daylight to, to get rid of that. If you go, if you're a Droid user like I am, you go to the Google Play Store. 
Now, these are for people. This is if you're committed to pray and you want to pray and just don't know how, go to the Google Play Store. You just got to find it. And if you're an uh, iPhone, you're an iPhone do that, right? You go to the, that store that where you, it's like Google Play, but it's Mac. It's called the, good name. It's a good name. It's the App Store. And you just, in the search bar, type in Open Doors Prayer App. Open Doors Prayer app, and uh, because I don't have, uh, you know, a fancy iPhone, it's probably something like download something. It'll, it'll guide you how to do it. Install that app, and it's going to send you alerts every day, perhaps sometimes several times a day, and it's going to tell you how to specifically pray. It's also going to give you information about urgent needs as persecuted believers all around the world are connected with Open Doors. Our church supports Open Doors and their ministry to the persecuted church. Our church supports Matthew Brandon Starnu and his work in Southeast Romania. Our church supports David Lawson and Hope and Help International into the ministry in Southeast Asia. We are engaged, and through, it's through your efforts, through your prayers, through your financial support that we're able to do this. So download that app. Pray every day for the persecuted church. Continue to pray for our brothers and sisters that it's worstest, most baddest to be a believer. Now, I'm going to ask uh, Robbie, I'm going to have, or for those of you who are watching from home and watching from all over the world, we are going to go dark because the next video we show, remember this is the one that I said must be present to watch. This is a very powerful video. So, Robin, I'm going to ask that you cut that feed. We'll see you all next time online. And let me know when that's cut, please.